welcome to The Shape of Dialogue. Today I'm talking to one of the world's most celebrated and influential public thinkers, Professor Steven Pinker. We're discussing metaphors and figurative language and how they're a window into the human mind. Stephen is the Johnstone Family Professor in the Department of Psychology at Harvard University. He is an experimental psychologist, cognitive scientist, linguist and famous science author. His works cover multiple domains, from psychology to language to rationality. He writes for many of the world's major publications and has written 12 highly influential books. And now I give you Stephen Pinker. Welcome to The Shape of Dialogue, Stephen. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast again. It's great to have you back back in, the, in New Zealand. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So we're going to talk about metaphors today. And metaphors are a key ingredient of figurative language. So to start, what is figurative language? And what are metaphors and why are they important? <clears throat> figurative language usually refers to speech or writing that we interpret as not referring to the conventional reference of words, the most common reference, but intending for us to have some association or connection or uh, non-literal uh, non, non -literal referent. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, uh, of course, there are also, uh, maybe I shouldn't say of course, because it's not as uh, obvious until you realize it, that uh, a, a surprising amount of our speech is metaphorical in a non-figurative way. This, is, of course, is an insight that goes to, uh, belongs to uh, George Lakoff and uh, Mark Johnson from their classic book, Metaphors We Live By, that it's not easy to find language that is not metaphorical, at least in its, uh, in its roots. We talk about, for example, uh, winning an argument, attacking a position, defending it, where we use the metaphor of war to talk about abstract intellectual debate. We talk about our relationship uh, being uh, on the rocks or proceeding uh, well or uh, hitting a bumpy spot where love is like a journey. And uh, until those are pointed out, we don't even realize that we're speaking in metaphor. I, I would call those non, not figurative language in the sense that as you interpret them in real time, you don't even realize that you are making some leap beyond the meanings of the words because they just come to uh, have the meaning that uh, probably at one time in the language was figurative, but now has become conventional. So it's sort of metaphors all the way down rather than turtles. Uh, all the, or a lot of the way down, anyway. Yeah. At some point, uh, things have got to refer to something. You know, move refers to move, uh, and stand refers to stand. But uh, the non-metaphorical core of a language is surprisingly small, especially if you look at the original roots of the words in uh, Anglo-Saxon. Lots of uh, uh, words are uh, have... Uh, if you look at their etymology in the dictionary, you realize that they are were originally metaphors, but the metaphors died long ago, and now and they've become conventional. Right. So, so things like up, down, left, right. There's no metaphorical uh, analog for those things. Uh, uh, not not unless you go to the dictionary, you look up their historical roots, and even there, you might find that they. Uh, uh, refer to something different. And, uh, right, I uh, here. I'm guessing I could I could verify this, but I think it meant something more like straight, direct, uh, as in which uh, a sense it it retains. But in terms of differentiating the two cardinal directions at right angles to the line of sight, it's possible that even they started out as metaphorical. Right. Right. It's quite interesting. Well, it's quite interesting because when I ask you to do the podcast um, about metaphors, I, you know, I've always been interested in metaphors. I've, I've been a teacher for a very long time. And as a teacher, as you probably know, and, and you're a writer as well, metaphors are indispensable for getting one concept or getting a concept from one mind to another. So um, but when I, when I started researching for the podcast, it, it became apparent that they're much, much, uh, much more important, much deeper than I had initially thought. Uh, I indeed, and metaphors are indispensable as poetic devices, at least fresh metaphors, but um, 
but metaphors do uh, uh, <clears throat> kind of die and just become a conventional part of the language until you're awakened to their metaphorical origins. Sometimes, as in win an argument, it's transparent once you start to think about it, the, uh, you know, to attack an argument or to defend an argument. But sometimes you have to go to the dictionary to realize that the, the roots originally were, uh, were, were metaphorical. Right. So just can you uh, explain exactly what a dead metaphor is and how they die? Uh, the, um, well, uh, you, perhaps you see it most often in, um, in, in, in mixed metaphors or in, in the overuse of the word literally. <laughs> so if, if, uh, if someone says uh, she literally emasculated him, uh, presumably that did not mean she actually took out a knife and castrated him, but figuratively demeaned his, his manhood, which we yeah. associate with the male sexual organs. Uh, or um, she literally exploded. Um, well, she uh, there explode, as in the case of uh, expressing anger, is uh, relies on the metaphor of uh, an object literally uh, blowing up. But uh, uh, the fact that you can have these somewhat comical uh, solecisms involving literally remind us that what might be a living metaphor in the ears of some people is a dead metaphor in the, in, uh, the ears of others. Uh, and in which case, it's hardly psychologically, it's no longer appropriate even to call it a metaphor. It's just a word. All words have to come from somewhere. And a lot of words originated as metaphors. When you think about it, um, where else could new words uh, uh, originate? They have to come from somewhere. There, sometimes there are wordsmiths who deliberately coin a word, but often uh, there's a need. Uh, they, something reminds someone else, uh, reminds someone of something else. They press the old word into service, guessing that their hearer will know what they're talking about if the term sticks it then becomes the new term for, for that item. Just a recent example would be a computer mouse. So this is a, kind of the size and um, uh, more or less the size of a mouse. It's got a tail. And um, Doug, Doug Engelbart, I believe in the 1970s, who, when he invented it, needed a term for it. So he wasn't going to call it, uh, you know, Ublek. Uh, so he uh, reached for something that would remind people of it, be easier to, to learn and we can sometimes forget the uh, original uh, connotation. And uh, you can probably think of dozens of examples of new technical terms that originated as metaphors, and sometimes you even forget that they are metaphors. Uh, yeah, it's interesting because when we go to put our hands on, on the mouse, um, if it was a mouse, we would would probably be quite repelled. But uh, in, Indeed, yes. But, but so it it, to, yeah, so we... we, we carry with them all of the uh, connotation of the original yeah, object, but yeah. some in this case, this more or less the size and shape. Yeah, yeah. So we, we can divide, you know, one sense, sense of the meaning off and, um, you know, graft another sense on very, very, very quickly. In the case of a, of a, of a figurative metaphor or a poetic metaphor, we, um, it's often the emotional uh, coloring that we most want to um, Bring, bring, bring along with a metaphor. And then sometimes there can be uh, intentionally or unintentionally humorous metaphors where the uh, semantic connection is clear, but the emotional connection is so discordant that the effect might be uh, jarring. I can, uh, if you uh, yeah. give me a, a second, I can even, I have a, had a list of them from a contest yeah, yeah. of a few years ago where people were invited to submit uh, the uh, the world's worst metaphors. <laughs> okay, and uh, I can yeah. even read a couple just to since that was a kind of abstract. Well, description. while while you're doing that, I um I found one. I think I can't remember if it was from from your book, um, the ballerina. I think yeah, I think it was from your the stuff of. Yes, um, I, I yeah. have that in front of me. Very yeah, good. I think I I think that that Rose, for Rose me Rose that's the worst one. one. Yeah, the ballerina rose gracefully on point and extended one slender leg behind her like a dog in a fire hydrant. <laughs> or uh, the revelation that his marriage of 30 years had disintegrated because of his wife's infidelity came as a rude shock, like a surcharge at a formerly surcharge-free ATM, <laughs> uh, automatic, automated teller machine. So there, the, uh, the what's, what's funny, the reason that we're chuckling is that 
the meaning of the metaphor is perfectly clear. But uh, when we use meta a fresh metaphor, we generally want to arouse some emotional or aesthetic reaction together with the, uh, the, the literal uh, physical resemblance or connection. And here they've been crafted so that they are uh, wildly incongruous. Yeah, yeah. So the, um, the juxtaposition of, of two uh, extreme uh, senses, in a sense, yeah. So, so essentially there, there has to be a synergy, an emotional synergy between both sides of the, uh, the metaphor. Well, there, at least when we use them figuratively, when they just fill a semantic gap in the language, then mm. all that's necessary is that right. it, um, well, originally, when the term was new, that the listener or reader knew what the uh, speaker or writer had in mind, then as they die and they just become part of the language, it doesn't matter. You just learn yeah. them the way you learn the other fifty to 100,000 words that you learn. Yeah, well, it's interesting going back to the mouse what we were saying before, in, in a way the the metaphor is actually a, a disjunct, isn't it? Um, you know, we don't really want to pick up a mouse every time we turn on the computer. So that's, indeed, that's, that's, that's a, a case in point. Indeed, where you want to just really leave behind some of the, uh, uh, the, the connotations of the metaphor. Yeah. Uh, but I think a good, um, well, I'll give you a, a, one of my favorite examples from Nabokov of, uh, mm. uh, from Pale Fire, the, the long poem by the fictitious uh, poet John Shade. I, I am the shadow of the wax wing slain, slain by the false azure of the window pane. Uh, there the metaphor is of a man who suffered a crushing blow in his life, analogized to a, um, a bird colliding with a, uh, a window where this, the sense of pathos of, uh, for the plight of a, an innocent and a beautiful bird, the um, uh, uh, undeserved uh, and sudden and unexpected uh, uh, accidental death, uh, like a tragedy that hits someone uh, um, uh, unprepared for it. There, the, and, and what makes that great literature, um, it, it's a, a great poem even standing on its own, in addition to the role that it played in the novel, uh, was that the emotional reaction that we have to the original referent of the metaphor, the, the uh, origin, uh, does carry over to the entity that it's being, uh, that's being referred to, and that is the intent. Uh, it's not just when a, uh, a man's daughter uh, commits suicide, it's as, it's, it's, it's like a um, a, a wax wing colliding with a, uh, a pane of glass. Well, it kind of is in that it's sudden and unexpected, but also the uh, emotion that we feel carries over. And that's a difference between literary metaphor and everyday metaphor. Uh, and the example of the, 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 the ballerina being compared to a dog at a fire hydrant would be an example where, for humorous effect, not only did the um, uh, emotional connotation not carry over, but it was chosen to clash with the our ordinary reaction, one of awe, of appreciation, of beauty and grace, as opposed to the rather more um, de de degraded image of a, of, of a dog urinating. So there it was uh, flipped for humorous sake more often, except in the cases of the um, unintentionally humorous mixed metaphor or use of literally, usually it's just in independent. It, the, the aesthetic and emotional component is neither here nor there. You're just trying to communicate. Yeah. Yeah. I'll never be able to go to the ballet again now. But uh, so, um, a, a figurative, is figurative language used equally across all cultures? Um, I'm not aware of a cross-linguistic uh, survey of whether conceptual metaphor, as Lakoff and J Johnson call it, uh, are found in all languages. And uh, one should be hesitant in making a generalization like that, because there are some 6,000 of them, depending on how you count. Yeah. And who knows whether there's knows? one somewhere or other that, that, that doesn't. I suspect they do, simply because I think it, it does reflect a property of the human mind. That is, we see similarities, the, uh, abstract similarities across uh, items that are uh, objects of our experience that are superficially different. Uh, 
uh, you know, the, 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 the scandal exploded, for example, there it's not even a, 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 a physical object, but we readily perceive the underlying similarity that I think is a feature of the human mind. It'd be surprising if, you, uh, if it wasn't exploited by uh, all languages. Uh, and also just the, the, um, the reality of the historical development of a language, namely no committee sits down and writes out every vocabulary item and then releases it like a big, heavy, unabridged dictionary. Words evolve, uh, new words appear in the language organically, and uh, they have to come from somewhere. And most of us aren't good enough wordsmiths to come up with a new sequence of sounds uh, out of the blue. Sometimes you know, Dr. Seuss was pretty good at it in uh, you know, uh, Ublek and Grinch and um, Sneetches. Sneetches, yeah. uh, so on. Most of us aren't that creative at the sound of a language, and, and even if we were, our we don't like to define words in the equivalent of dictionary definitions in conversation. So instead, we reach for a word that we expect our hearer to already know, where the similarity to what to the entity lacking a name is apparent enough for a listener to pick up, and uh, so we use language metaphorically to to fill in the gaps. And then the ones that stick change the language. It's, uh, you know, again, I, I, I can't declare from my, I am sitting in an armchair. I can't say, declare from my armchair that this is found in all languages, but given the combination of the human psychology and the historical processes that shape a language's vocabulary, I'd be surprised if it wasn't present in most languages. Right. I recently read, well, in preparation for this, I reread the Epic of Gilgamesh, which, um, for people who don't know what that is, it's, I think it's our oldest uh, written narrative. Um, from Mesopotamia, I think 2000 BC, roughly around then, mm -hmm. to, see, to see if that was you know, replete with metaphors, and it, it definitely was not. Um, there were, the metaphors were very, very few and far bet between, and the, the metaphors would, were not that poetic. Um, so it's very, you know, the, the text is very literal, you know, he did this, she did that, he did that to her, uh, he did that to, the, you know, to them. And I, th I thought that was interesting is, you know, to use, to use a word that you often use in, in your talks about language is very concrete, mm -hmm. which ironically is a metaphor. There, there, there you go. Very good. Yeah. Um, Yes, although what we don't know, since you were presumably reading it in English translation, yeah. is whether the uh, words in the original, what, what would it have been, Sumerian? Uh, I, no, it's not, it's, it's, I can't remember, I, I did look at it yesterday, it's a, I, I'll have to look it up. It's I, I not Sumerian. Know, whatever the language was, yeah, we that's don't a good know point. how the yeah. words, the original words, whether they may have been metaphors. Yeah, that, that, that is a good point. Um, I my first guest on the podcast was Professor James Flynn, and he talked about a similar thing, basically the difference between um, a modern mind, um, which is a much more conceptual mind. You know, we're dealing. You know, most uh, a, lot, a lot of the population sit in front of a computer all day. They're d dealing with conceptual um, processes. As opposed to, uh, I suppose, I, I, I can't really think of a, a good word other than a manual mind, someone who's like, say, a hunter, hunter and gatherer or a farmer, where they they live in the concrete world. And he was he was talking about how um, I think it was a Russian psychologist had studied. Um, yes, uh, um, uh, Luria. Luria, that's right. And it was in yes. Siberia or something <clears throat> like that. What, do, uh, yeah, uh, do you want to talk right. to that? Yes. And, 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 and he was saying, the, the psychologist would ask him a question, you know, like if, you know, all, all the rabbits in this area are brown, but if there was a white one, you know, would you still kill it or something like that? And the no, answer, so yeah, no, you, yeah. You, 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 yeah you, you, you go for it. The example is all animals in uh, Siberia are white. Um, are the rabbits white? Right, right. And the farmers would say, well, how do I know? I've never been to Siberia. And yeah. he said, well, I just told you, all the animals in Siberia are, are white. And he'd say, well, it's not a matter of, of, of words. You can't just make them white by saying that they're white. I, right. I haven't been here. If uh, you showed me, if I got to see them and I never saw a white rabbit, then, uh, a non-white rabbit, then I'd agree with you. Now, of course, these are not stupid answers, but they're not the answers that we've come to uh, expect. Given our use of formal 
uh, reasoning, that is where you are asked to come to conclusions that, depends, that, that depend not on personal experience, but on the form of the uh, arguments. That is, uh, the way they are framed in words. That is a school-driven uh, skill, but it is not the natural human means of thinking. What do metaphors tell us about the human mind? I think they uh, help explain a big mystery of the mind, at least uh, so I argued in my book, The Stuff of Thought. Namely, I sometimes call it Wallace's paradox after Alfred Russell Wallace, the co-discoverer of the theory of natural selection with Charles Darwin. And Wallace said, how is it that uh, given that we evolved in as hunter-gatherers uh, without uh, writing, uh, mathematics, formal science, formal government, how is it that we're cognitively capable of doing these things? It would have conferred no survival advantage in the Pleistocene. And he um, actually became a creationist when it came to the human mind. He said, yeah, yeah, my theory of evolution applies to animals, it applies to the body, but when it comes to human intelligence, there must have been a um, divine uh, source that implanted a, a mind in each one of us. Uh, almost the uh, uh, analogous to the position of the Catholic Church, which has come to make its peace with evolution as long as you draw the line at the human soul. Now, I, I don't think that Wallace had the right solution, but he did raise an interesting puzzle. And I think part of the answer is that our intuitions, which indeed were uh, tailored to concrete notions like object, space, path, motion, force, could be metaphorically extended to uh, any kind of causation. Uh, uh, that is the concept of a person actually, you know, lifting up a rock and throwing it could be applied to a prime minister implementing a policy. The uh, spatial metaphor of a um, uh, a rock falling could be extended to the um, consumer price index falling. And not a lot. that's why a lot of our language is metaphorical. Namely, we don't have the um, simple mental concepts that correspond to the abstract uh, um, um, notions of science and economics and politics and religion and so on. Um, the, uh, we do have the ability to kind of bleach out the sensory motor content of concepts like force or move or for that matter concrete or attack and preserve some conceptual skeleton like attack needn't mean that you pummel someone with your fists it can mean or or plunge a knife into them it can just mean um, deliberately cause them harm so the, our conceptual apparatus has the ability to strip away the sensory motor content preserving this uh, conceptual skeleton of causes, changes, uh, agency, forces, resistance. Um, thanks to this gift, we can start with a built-in repertoire of concrete concepts and think about uh, abstract domains like uh, governance, philosophy, religion, science, math, and so on. And of course, it's not the case that we any individual can reconstruct say newton's laws to say nothing of einstein's relativity just by thinking each one of us uh sits at the top of a pyramid of people building complex concepts out of simple concepts which is another part of our cognitive repertoire that makes humans so powerful even though our cognition originated in uh, much more concrete concerns but we can package um, a set of simple concepts into a more complex concept, which then itself functions as a single cognitive unit. Cognitive psychologists call it a chunk. And uh, we can build um, bigger chunks out of smaller chunks and still bigger chunks out of the big chunks. Uh, and since our memory is limited, we can't hold uh, a thousand ideas in, in mind at once, as long as we can package them into uh, assemblies that we can then give names to, we can handle quite complex or abstract uh, concepts. So this is, these are, uh, the, in the final chapter of the stuff of thought, I offer this as 
uh, my uh, solution to Wallace's paradox, and it essentially depends on uh, the uh, ability to use metaphor, which I take it to be the stripping away of sensory motor, or at least some of the sensory motor content to preserve some of the uh, abstract structure. Right. We had two things. Essentially, it's, it's a bit like Russian dolls, where you've got, um, you know, metaphors within metaphors within metaphors. Yeah, so in fact, the way I think of it is really there, there, there are two different dimensions here. There's the assembly of uh, complex set of, of smaller things. And this may just be the way all complex entities uh, can be stable. This is a point made by the um, cognitive psychologist and artificial intelligence pioneer and economist Herbert Simon in his in a uh, beautiful essay called The Architecture of Complexity. He argued that anything in the universe that's complex is likely to be built out of assemblies which are built out of smaller assemblies and so on. So you've got bodies that are made out of systems which are composed of organs which are made out of tissues which consist of cells which uh, are, are uh, contain organelles You've got armies that are divided into divisions, which are divided into battalions and then you know, squads and, and platoons. Uh, you have universities with faculties and then departments and areas, etc. That that's the only way he suggested that complex entities could resist all of the forces of decay and chaos and, and random change that would otherwise degrade them. Now that may be, would seem to be true of um, human concepts as well, of complex religious ideas, philosophical ideas, mathematical ideas, scientific ideas. So to understand the concept, say, of a derivative in calculus, you first have to have mastered the building blocks of algebra, of you know, what does is, what is y equals 3x squared mean? To do that, you have to have the concept of multiplication, x squared is x times x. Um, to uh, uh, master that, you have to have the concept of number, uh, and that may be true of uh, anything that's complex, but certainly true of complex ideas. Together with that, though, I think metaphor is a uh, almost a, an independent dimension, namely at any level of that hierarchy. The, our ideas need not refer to concrete chunks of stuff in the world, but can refer to the uh, bare skeleton of ideas. You put those together and you can get a mind that was adapted to think about the concrete here and now, which can be stretched to, to, to deal with uh, abstract uh, theoretical notions. Yeah, so so there is a point, uh, well, there must have been an evolutionary point in which it was a very concrete mind, and then it literally started to fly or levitate above that into, into that metaphorical realm. Uh, indeed, uh, and presumably we get a, a something of a glimpse into the those uh, uh, concrete building blocks by looking at the our cousins chimpanzees which can they can, they can make tools they can um, coordinate their their behavior they clearly can reason about their physical and social surroundings but they're not so good at math <laughs> they're good at memory though they do have a memory yes well you know that, you, i mean you've seen those um i mean this is just an aside those those memory games they play on computers they're actually better than computer uh, humans anyway yeah so so from an evolutionary point of view i mean if we you know if we look at chimps and we look at ourselves and we're you know what are we 99 percent the same genetically and we think why is there a difference but if you think of it in terms of how you've just put it complex things are made of um you know multiple co component parts each incremental step you know, you can be a chimp chimpanzee in over 100,000 years or whatever the time period is, you can make a, a, a smaller, a small incremental step and then they recursively build on each other to get to, to what we are now. Uh, yes, I, I think there's the capacity to uh, embed concepts in, in other concepts. There's yes. obviously capacity to share those in language so we don't have to build our own from scratch. Uh, and there's the capacity to, um, to, to to peel off abstract structure, leaving behind the physical content. Yeah. I've just written something down here, which I'll, I'll read to you and um, tell me what you think. I said, which is, you know, about what we're talking about. 
to a dog, a stick is a recursive entity. A stick is a stick is a stick is a stick, ad, inf ad infinitum. To a human, a stick is a stick, a lever, a bludgeon, a plough, a spear, a beater, a fire, ad infinitum. So it's our mental dexterity that finds the relationships between these diverse entities and modes of operations. And with metaphors, are we not just doing the same thing linguistically? Our mental dexterity connecting concepts to innovate our way out of cognitive dead ends, such as a stick is a stick is a stick is a stick. What are your thoughts on that? Yes, uh, and I, I doubt that the dog has the thought a stick is a stick. <laughs> uh, the, um, uh, even uh, recursive functions have to be built on some non-recursive bedrock. Um, otherwise, it, you get an infinite regress. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so just as an example, a classic definite. What, what does recursion mean? Well, that's a, a definition that refers to uh, it's a, a definition of a entity that refers to the entity itself. Yeah. Uh, which might seem circular, like if I say factorial, the concept of factorial, like five factorial is five times four times three times two times one. Uh, you could say. Uh, the definition of, of n factor, factorial is n times n minus 1 factorial. You hear that and you think, so that is the, what is 5 factorial? It's 5 times 4 factorial. You might say, well, that, what kind of definition is that? I ask you what factorial means and you just, it's, you know, it's, it's circular. You just give me uh, another factorial as the meaning of factorial. What's the, what's the point of that? And the answer, of course, is that it isn't. Uh, recursive all the way down when it comes to uh, one you just say one is one factorial or one factorial is one I should say right um, uh, so do well essentially metaphors scale and leverage language don't they that's what we've, we've been talking about they, 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 they can take just, simple uh, they can take simple concepts and expand it sort of to infinity uh, that, that that's right. Now, you know, in, in theory, you could extend the vocabulary of a language by just coining new sounds like Dr. Seuss did, uh, or uh, James Joyce with a quark, then later co-opted by Murray Gell-Mann to refer to the constituents of a uh, proton or a neutron. Um, uh, but most of us, and, and you know, people do, they can also use onom onomatopoeia to snarf something, meaning to grab it furtively and quickly, where the act of articulating the word reminds people of the referent of the word, so that's not necessarily metaphorical. But still, the sounds have to come from somewhere. The uh, meaning has to be apparent to the first listener, and so metaphor is an obvious route to doing that, where the metaphor then, uh, then dies. Yeah. Well, there's... Uh, if, if, it, if it goes viral and it stays in the language long enough. Yeah. Well, there's an efficiency there, isn't it? It's easier to grab something, you know, going back to our concrete word, it's easier to grab something concrete already existing that everyone uh, knows what is and knows how to use it and then just extrapolate, uh, you know, another meaning. It gives it that. a leg up. Now, we're all cap yeah. ultimately, we are all capable of memorizing arbitrary connections between a, a sound and a meaning uh, and our original vocabulary, knowing that dog means dog and cheese means cheese, just depends on brute memorization of the sound and the, and the meaning yeah so even if word sounds came out of the blue we you know we do we do pretty well with them but the words have to come from somewhere originally and the coiner of a new term is apt to reach for a a, a, a metaphor um i'm just looking here at random things in a, in, in my my book the stuff thoughts so of visual field uh, well, that's the extent of the world that you can take in from your eyeballs. But a field, of course, is a, um, uh, a stretch of terrain. Um, grasp the scenario. Um, well, by that I meant understand, but we use the metaphor of to, to comprehend something is to hold it. Um, even expression, uh, expression literally uh, meant to press out uh, as in expressing milk uh, but we press that into service to refer to uh, communicating an idea uh, so I, I, that was just my eyes alighting on a uh, paragraph and just picking out a random sentence but I could do that uh, a parallel between a physical realm and a conceptual realm 
parallel two lines that uh, go in the same direction. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and we could, uh, you, you could do that in just about any passage of prose. Again, these are not literary metaphors. Yeah. You don't get any um, uh, uh, emotional uh, chill or frisson when you hear them. You don't visualize the referent, which is again how mixed metaphors come about, yeah. uh, or um, f literal uses of figurative. Uh, just to make it clear, what a, a, a mixed metaphor would be: uh, if when you open a can of worms, they always come home to roost. Uh, that's that's one here in my what? collection. Why are mixed metaphors so bad? Well, I mean, you know, I mean, what, was, are, I, another way: what's wrong with them? What's wrong with them is that they, um, well, what what ca causes them, what causes them us to notice that they're mixed metaphors is the process we've been talking about, namely that what starts out as a metaphor dies, becomes a dead metaphor, in which case it's barely a metaphor, just the way you uh, explain something. But for someone who thinks a little more reflectively about the meaning of words, and that is that they do... Uh, call to mind the concrete referent of the words, then when two of them are combined in a sentence, you can uh, drive a, a incongruous image, which was lost to the speaker for whom the metaphors were strictly dead and um, uh, uh, just conventional means of communicating something. Let me, as long as we're talking about it, may as well yeah. find a couple more examples yeah. in my uh, collection. Yeah, well, so so essentially, they're they're bad because they're they're just like a bad metaphor, like like our ballerina. Well, they're bad because they weren't a metaphor in the first place for the speaker. Mm. That is, they these are expressions that cease being metaphors, but are mm. simply the conventional way to express a concept. Mm. Then, when they're combined with another dead metaphor, in the mind of the speaker. It's just literal communication in the mind of a somewhat more reflective or perceptive listener who does retain the original reference. The image can be incongruous or even um, uh, uh, humorous. Uh, here, a couple other examples. Once again, the Achilles heel of the eagle's defense reared its ugly head. Now, Achilles heel rear its ugly head. Those are two. We, we call them cliches, in fact, when they yeah. become dead. Um, those, here's another one. Those professors tilt at the windmills of a capitalist patriarchy from whose teat they feed. <laughs> now, a, a windmill with a teat is a rather <laughs> odd concept, uh, but for the writer here, tilt at a windmill, dead metaphor, right. a dead idiom, really, uh, feed upon a teat, another, uh, yeah. not, not a cliche, but clearly did no longer functioned as a living image in the uh, mind of that speaker. Yeah, it's sort of when, when it's like they haven't looked backwards. They've got halfway through the metaphor and haven't looked backwards and related. Yes, to or I, I once heard a radio psychotherapist who said, for some patients, uh, cancer can be a growth experience. <laughs> oh, ouch. <laughs> or uh, and there's also there's a whole um, family of, um, of these, these uh, Solar systems attributed to the movie mogul Samuel Goldwyn, yeah. sometimes called Goldwynisms. No doubt, many of them apocryphal. Probably some of them actually created by his own scriptwriters and then attributed to him for humorous <laughs> effect. Perhaps the most famous being an oral agreement isn't worth the paper yeah. it's written on. Yeah, that's beautiful, isn't it? Uh, and don't don't name, don't name your son uh, Richard. Every Tom, Dick, and Harry is named Richard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or. Uh, uh, also attributed to the American baseball catcher Yogi Berra, uh, oh, there are right. a number of, uh, of examples like, uh, oh, it, it it gets laid out there early, um, or uh, no one goes there anymore; it's too crowded. <laughs> and who also yeah. may may or may not have said, "I never said most of the things I said." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, my favorite one. Um... I think it's from him. Is um, you know, prediction is really hard, especially about the future. Yes, I, I also attribute it to Yogi Berra. Yeah, yeah. Hey, now I want to talk about cheesecake now. So, um, 
you've famously said that famously said that music is auditory cheesecake, an exquisite confection crafted to tickle the sensitive spots of our mental capacities. Now, with that in mind, are not metaphors linguistic cheesecake? Are they not irresistible bonbons satiating our rhetorical sweet tooth? Yeah, but yeah possibly. I mean, I use the metaphor which um, many people um, uh, bridle at, at hearing. Uh, because they like to think of music as something exalted and as of cheesecake as a uh, pointless indulgence. Um, I, I reached that metaphor knowing that the there was a uh, a clash, you know, a little bit about like the like the ballerina being compared to the the dog at the hydrant, uh, because I I actually wanted not for humorous effect, but for scientific effect, try to shake people out of their familiarity with music as, a, as an exalted art form and to look at it through uh, psychological spectacles as, um, uh, uh, as a, um, at least according to the hypothesis that I was suggesting, something that we deliberately craft in order to give us pleasure. This is in contrast to the idea that music is a Darwinian adaptation, like the liver, like uh, three-dimensional vision, um, that uh, which is seems to be people's default assumption. I think part of the um, fallacy that everything in our biology must be a product of Darwinian natural selection, but also the misconception that if something is um, a, an evolved adaptation, then it is more um, useful to be cherished, treasured, encouraged, where if something is just um, is something we invent in order to pre press our own pleasure buttons, then uh, it, it's frivolous and dispensable and maybe we should uh, sacrifice it from our school curriculum when buttons get tight. I think that's the underlying subtext. So there's a, there's a strong reaction against it. But uh, I don't, personally, I don't see why it's so uplifting to think that music actually made our ancestors have more babies uh, which is what a Darwinian adaptation yeah. requires or, or but, when uh, or when wars or when yeah. wars I don't yeah. see what's so what's so great about that yeah. uh, I don't see what's so terrible about something that we design in order to give us pleasure but uh, people who want to exalt music take a, uh, offense at that at that metaphor yeah well I, um, I don't know if you know but I am a musician and um, I, well, I, I can guess from your backdrop, yes. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was trying to hide it. But um, yeah, and, you know, m music is um, sort of the core of my being. Um, I actually love the, I love, when I first read it, I loved it, the, the, the concept of Oh, cheesecake. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. And, you yeah. know, what's, what's so terrible about giving people pleasure? Why is and that something what, to be ashamed of? What's wrong with cheesecake? I mean, What's is, wrong with is there yeah, anything I, I, is there anything better than cheesecake? I would say there, there isn't. So, yeah. I, I, in a sense, it's a sort of a reverse compliment. Um, it, uh, it could be, although many people did not. Uh, yeah, yeah, it that yeah, way. yeah. But uh, it, yeah, it's, I, I thought there was an interesting controversy. Now, um, the the other, you know, one uh, often it's it's good to define something by what it's not. Uh, legal writing is generally bereft of metaphors, and uh, I'm going to quote you a passage from the recent New Zealand Plain Language Act, which I, I thought you might be interested because in, you're interested in plain language. Um, okay, here it is. The purpose of this act is to improve the effectiveness and accountability of public service agencies and crown agents, and to improve accessibility of certain documents that they are made that they make available to the public by providing for those documents to use language that is, one, appropriate to the intended audience, and two, clear, concise, and well organized. Um, the irony is I, I thought just as a, as, a, as a fun experiment, I plugged it into uh, Grammarly, which is a writing app which, you know, helps transform prose into clear, concise, and well-organized language. And uh, unsurprisingly, it flashed up a, uh, a readability alert, and it said, this sentence is hard to read. <laughs> <laughs> Ironically I, enough. Yes. I thought that was beautiful. I, and that's not the, I, and I, I, I appreciate that judgment, although it's certainly not the worst of, of uh, government no. or No, no. You could, you could I, come I, up with much worse examples, yes. Yeah, well, I mean... 
I could understand it. So, um, but yeah, it didn't. It doesn't I'm roll very, off the tongue. It certainly, grammar, Grammarly is right in that it, it is not the uh, most limpid or graceful uh, sentence. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it, it, we know that it gets a lot worse than that. Yeah, uh, I'm tempted by to the get... are, By the way, you know, clear uh, writing as opposed to bloated, uh, turgid. Again, we can't you can't avoid the metaphors. Although I, it must be said that when you refer to the uh, the expression the crown, something I'm familiar with as a Canadian, right? That actually again that's concrete language to refer to an abstract entity in this case uh, government but it is not a metaphor it's a metonym yes that is it's we're referring to something not by virtue of some underlying similarity because there's no there, there you're not supposed to perceive any similarity between a government uh, agency and a literal crown but just there's a chain of associations governments are at least in in uh, constitutional monarchies are headed by a sovereign who wears a crown and so we use the associate uh to refer to the the government the, the, the something connected with it to refer to the thing so not everything is a metaphor and, and listen again as you point out uh, you only understand something when you know what it's not and if listeners are saying well oh geez these guys are saying everything is a metaphor so that means nothing is a metaphor does it doesn't even mean anything the answer is yes there's a perfect example of concrete language being used to refer to an abstract concept but not with use of metaphor right well metonym it, being a different a different yes. uh, psychological process and a different literary uh device yes well that's why i started the podcast talking about uh wanted you to talk about figurative language because and in, in, in a sense uh, you know much of the conversation we, we use metaphor as a proxy for phys- figurative language would you agree with that mm-hmm. yeah um, I, not not exactly, because yeah. a metonym would be a counterexample. It's figurative, but it's uh, it's not metaphorical. Yeah. No, but what I'm saying is we're just, just saying, you know, metaphor is a proxy for all those figurative Yes, languages. I mean, and one could, I, yeah. you could even say a metaphor is a, maybe even a metonym for figurative language. <laughs> uh, yeah. Or is it, a, is it a synecdoche? I always have trouble. Uh, yeah, I can't. Which. Yeah, I, I, I struggle keeping up what's with what's what. So so going back to our beautiful uh, bit of prose from, from the um, Plain Language Act, I mean, it's interesting. So there are, there is, yeah, let's use the, word, the term figurative language rather than metaphors. There is figurative language in there, but it's not replete with figurative language. And much, you know, if you read legal documents, it, it ain't fun. Um, you know, I don't know how people can be lawyers, but why is that? Why do why is legal language oh. not well? So legal language it? not only is it um, non-figurative, but it tends to be verbose and prolix. And um, sorry, what, what was that term? Uh, the last term? Oh, a uh, prolix. What's that mean? And verbose. What's uh, prolix? prolix? Meaning uh, um, o- 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 apparently overly long. Um, right. You're too too much going on at length too much yeah, yeah. Uh, and there is a reason for that and, and also it seems to be labor the obvious it seems to be pedantic and there are reasons for all of that namely and this is a, a major finding in linguistics that ordinary conversation depends on cooperation you've got a speaker and a hearer and they take turns but they're in it for the benefit of both of them. They're exchanging information, they're forging relationships. And you don't have to spell everything out. You can um, count on the charity of the listener to connect the dots so that you don't have to spell out every single step, which would quickly bog conversation down. The point of legal language is to adjudicate disputes between uh, adversaries. It's not cooperative. Uh, And so uh, things that can be left to the imagination whether filling in missing links in a uh, deduction or making metaphorical leaps you can't count on your listener or your reader to do that because you're they're they're your enemy and so everything has to be spelled out uh, in thuddingly concrete terms with nothing left to the imagination so legal language doesn't work as conversation but then again it's not meant for cooperative partners, it's, it's um, intended for adversaries. You know, we have the expression uh, to be on speaking terms, which pinpoints the idea that, that speech, at least in the ordinary conversational sense, depends on at least some degree of cooperation. When you have utter adversaries, 
say, opposing coaches prior to a football match, they don't get together and have a, a little chit chat. Uh, there's nothing that one could say that the other one would, would, would uh, that they'd want the other one to hear because it could only be used against him. So uh, the uh, conversation, cooperation, go together and legal language is the exception that proves that rule. Right. Yeah, well, uh, how I thought of it is, you know, the age old narrative rule, show, don't tell. Um, legal language is sort of the opposite. It, it tells rather than shows. Uh, indeed, that's right. Uh, yeah. So in, in, in good fiction writing, for that matter, a lot of good nonfiction writing, yeah. don't tell, show. Yeah. Uh, but it works because when you show something, you can count on a charitable uh, uh, reader or listener guessing what you had in mind in showing that. But that's something you don't want to take a chance at when uh, someone's reading a passage with an eye toward getting the better of you. Yeah. Hey, I'm very aware of the time. We've, we've yes, done, okay. done 45 minutes. Are you, are you, do, you, do you have a hard stop? Um, it, any, any minute now. So okay. maybe one okay. more question. Okay. Okay. Um, I looked at Martin Luther King's um, I Have a Dream speech and, uh, you know, uh, I read it and was sort of almost moved to tears. It was so, so incredibly brilliant. Why, and the, the use of metaphor in there is extreme. It's just absolutely fantastic. Why is it so persuasive? Why, you know, yes, not, that, yes, not just that speech, but when we want to be persuasive, we use metaphor. We don't use legal language. That's right. It's, um, well, of course, it is uh, built on the metaphor of a, 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 of a dream. Yeah. Uh, something that is not currently real, but that uh, can be uh, vividly imagined. But it's uh, any gifted orator uh, uses every device in the book, metaphor being one of them, but also um, the, 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 the music and melody of language. Uh, the not, my children will be judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Uh, the alliteration is evocative. Um, the uh, the imagery, even when it's not metaphorical, uh, the the Red Hills of Georgia, uh, the uh, each case they're referring to people in the country by some vivid visual descriptor of where they live, so that you are not the the speech, even though it is musical not just in his own delivery, but in the choice of consonants and uh, a prosody that is rhythm uh, and, and um, rep repetition. One of the effective techniques of oratory is to repeat something often with a slight variation, such as I have a dream that introducing one part of the image after another. But what it does is it, it uh, prevents you from being lulled into hearing the language is just verbiage, just blah, 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 which is really what language is. It's just a bunch of sounds. Yeah. But the, the point of, uh, uh, unlike, uh, say, a jazz solo of scat singing, where the sound is the only thing, the whole point of language is to evoke emotions and images in the mind of the listener by using uh, vivid images, by... Um, counting on the pleasure that we get. Uh, again, these are the sources of pleasure that musicians use to, to make music into a tasty confection, such as repetition, such as rhythm, such as alliteration, such as rhyme, such as assonance. Uh, there's also a, 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 together with the uh, being continually awakened to the underlying imagery, as opposed to just hearing it, there is a pleasure taken in the sounds of, of the words, a pleasure which then amplifies the feeling of moral inspiration or uplift. This is special speech. You're not just telling your partner what to bring home from the, the grocery store. You're intending to inspire them to take on challenges that may be difficult, but were, are ultimately rewarding. And to do that, you've got to appeal to their emotions and you've got to use the various aspects of language that can be effective in arousing emotions. Yeah. Well, in a sense, there's quite a lot of cheesecake in it. Uh, indeed, in, in, in the best of all possible ways. Yes, and as we both agreed, there's nothing wrong with cheesecake. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much once again. Uh, it's been a 
a, a great, great honor and an experience talking to you again. And um, yeah, just thank you so much. Pleasure was mine. Thank you for having me.